This is the updated installation video for the Tormach 15L lathe and turret. It's not a replacement for the operator's document or turret installation guide. The largest change to this installation is the installation of the turret. To find the documents, you can scan the QR code on the shipping box. A website will open up and then you can enter the part number. The document will open up on your device. Lathe prep and setup. Start removing the shipping material with a razor. Then use strap snips and a small pry bar to open and disassemble the shipping crate. Remove the crate top first, followed by the four sides. Be careful with the nails as you move the crate panels. Turn the crate with a pallet jack if needed. Then remove the moisture barrier. Open the coolant tank door and slide the coolant tank off the shipping pallet. Cut the straps that secure the e-stop box and power cable to the pallet and place them aside. Remove the two axis panels on the front and back and set them aside with screws. Loosen and remove the lock and retaining nuts from inside the axis panels with a 17 mm open end wrench. Identify the two right hand bolts located inside the controller cabinet. Loosen and remove the nuts and washers from the two bolts from the front and back of the cabinet. The preferred method to lift the lathe off of the pallet is to attach some lifting feet. We have four. It's in the set, uh, part number 33269. It comes with the four feet, the pads, and four screws. Use these to jack them up. To get them on, you need to take a sawzall and cut a strip of wood all the way down the length of the pallet on both sides and up against the supports underneath. I originally cut notches at each lifting foot location, but now the lathe is shipped on a wider pallet so that no longer works. Secure each foot with the four sets of socket head cap screws, locking washers, and washers. Repeat these steps at all four lifting foot locations. Slide a lifting pad underneath each of the four installed lifting feet. Thread each M20 threaded rod through each lifting foot and into its lifting pad. To raise the lathe with a threaded rod, a socket wrench will work, but an impact wrench is better. Gradually adjust each lifting foot to raise the lathe evenly until the lathe is clear of the floor. Here I had to cut off the section of the pallet floor that I didn't cut off earlier. Slide the pallet from underneath the lathe and discard. Since the intention of this video is to demonstrate the installation of the turret inside the enclosure, we need to keep the lifting feet on until we get to that. If you don't intend to install the turret, you can install the lathe feet and then remove the lifting feet. You can look in the manual for that or jump ahead in this video. The machine arm mounts to the right side of the lathe for easy access, but before we get to that, we need to remove the items inside the machine stand. Use a breaker bar to open up the controller arm box. Find the two sets of socket head cap screws, locking washers, washers, and nuts. The controller arm mounts with the cable openings facing the back of the lathe. Mount the arm to the two front holes and securely tighten with the locking washers, washers, and socket head cap screws. For extra stability, two nuts are installed in the top of the controller cabinet and inside of the machine stand. You will need to open up the enclosure door and reach to the top front corner to secure one of them. Slide the post into the arm and use two wrenches to tighten the post base. The short monitor arm should be installed on the bottom. Use a wrench to remove the bolt and nylon washer. Flip the arm over and re-secure it. Find the four socket head cap screws locking washers and washers for the keyboard tray. Then attach each to the underside of the tray and secure into the monitor arm. Do not over tighten. Use an 8mm hex wrench and a 16mm open end wrench to tighten each of the monitor arm joints. The PathPilot controller is installed on this Visa mount. If you're using the standard monitor, you keep this plate on. In this situation, we're installing the touchscreen, so we need to replace this plate with this one and then attach the visa mount onto that. Use
Using a touchscreen kit, you must first remove the stock mounting bracket from the back of the monitor with a Phillips screwdriver. Since I am attaching this on my own, I aligned the Visa controller mount holes to the touchscreen, which I taped in place temporarily. Otherwise, you will need an extra hand. Then, secure the touchscreen with the four provided M4 socket head cap screws. You can then remove the tape. Flip the PathPilot controller over and attach the four standoffs on the bottom by hand. Then place the PathPilot controller mounting plate on top of the Visa mount so that the keyhole slots are facing away from the monitor. Then secure with the provided screws. Align the standoffs and secure the controller into place. Find the DV25 to Ethernet adapter and remove the film from the double-sided tape on the case. Align the case between the PathPilot controller Visa mount screws and press firmly to attach it in place. Untie the power cable bundle, then attach the provided Ethernet cord to the adapter and connect the other end to the controller. Place a keyboard tray, mouse, and shuttle controller on the tray and run the cables toward the controller. Start connecting the HDMI cable, the USB cables, and the power cord to the PathPilot controller. Then secure the DB25 cable to the Ethernet adapter. Then the Wi-Fi receiver, and the other USB cable to the controller. On the back of the monitor, connect the power cord, then the HDMI cable, and the touchscreen USB cable. Make sure to secure this with the finger screws. To manage a cable, start by installing the wire tie mounts onto the monitor post with the provided screws. Two of the AC adapters are secured to the monitor post with the white wire tie mounts. Remove the backing one at a time and place where the AC adapter cables will lay. Then secure the cable ends with the wire ties. Do this for both the AC adapters. When you attach the AC adapters to the machine arm, make sure you attach the cable on this end with the male plug. We provide two extension cables to reach the back side of the lathe. In addition, for the adapter for the DB25 to uh, Ethernet, we also provide an extension cord to get to the back of the machine as well. It's also good to have on hand an assortment of cable ties in case you make a mistake. We provide enough cable ties, but just enough. To manage the cable underneath the controller, Wrap them as neatly as possible into two bundles. Then wire tie them to the monitor arm supports. Strap the wires down to the monitor post and turn the keyboard tray to check for any binding. Cut off the excess wire ties. To give the AC adapters extra support, use several large wire ties to strap them down to the arm while also securing the DB25 cable. Run the extension cables and the DB25 cable through the side pass through and then out the back. Place each cable onto the rear wire trough towards the electrical inputs. Then route the e-stop cable onto the wire trough and towards the keyboard tray. Plug in the DB25 cable and secure with the finger screws. Plug in the controller cable and plug a three gang outlet strip into the monitor input and plug the remaining power cords into this. Use the provided power cord and insert it into the power input location. Use the wire ties to bundle the cable together on the trough. Cut off the excess. Then secure the e-stop button by hand with the Phillips screwdriver. Okay, I'm attaching the accessory enclosure light. I've already done that. It's very easy. It's just a couple screws up top. You can do that. The difficult part is getting this electrical cable through the casting and out the side. I've been struggling with it and then I realized there's something simple you could do. The packing for the 15L also includes some plastic strapping. 
make sure you don't throw this out because this is like the perfect thing to fish through the side into the lathe and then fish out the cable. So I'm gonna show you how to do that next. Fish a strapping through the access hole on the left side. This will go down through the machine casting and into the chip tray. You can reach under the casting to pull the strapping through or have someone help you. Tape the enclosure light power cord to the strapping, then carefully pull it through the side and remove the tape. Use wire ties to strap the power cord to the cables running along the back of the enclosure interior. Cut off the excess wire ties. Installing the automatic oiler. If you're installing the automatic oiler on an already assembled machine, you will need to go through the shutdown procedure if it is on. Click exit on PathPilot, then e-stop the machine at either location. Click OK on the pop-up dialog and turn the power switch to off. The automatic oiler is installed underneath the machine arm. Use a Phillips screwdriver to secure the provided screws on either side. The pre-installed brass fitting will impede the door panel, so remove it with a wrench. Wrap some pipe tape around the threads of the small seal and secure it into the input with an Allen wrench. Then remove the gauge with a wrench and set aside. Find the long fitting that is provided with the kit and wrap the lower threads with pipe tape. Secure it into the oiler with a wrench. Then re-secure the gauge, which you've wrapped with pipe tape, to the top of the oiler. Wrap pipe tape onto the short fitting adapter and secure it to the tall fitting with a wrench. Attach the oil line with the ferrule into the adapter and secure with a wrench. Pour some whey oil into the reservoir so that the automatic oiler's alarm doesn't go off when you start up the lathe. Remove the cover off the top of the oiler with a Phillips screwdriver and set aside these parts. We are first removing the installed power cable by loosening its wires from the two power connections and then from the ground. Use a small flat bladed screwdriver for this. Then loosen the cord grip nut and pull the power cable out of the oiler through the grip on the side. You can discard this power cord. Inside the automatic oiler kit is an electrical cable. Uh, there's two ends. This end that's been stripped down already goes through the lathe and into the electrical cabinet. Don't cut off these ends to attach into the automatic oiler. This is the end you need to just cut off a few inches to get to the cables to attach to the top of the automatic oiler. Cut back in the new power cord sheath a few inches and clean off the excess insulation. Strip off about a quarter inch off the tips of each cable. Feed the cord through the cord grip nut and then through the cord grip. Insert the ground into the oiler's ground terminal and secure the terminal screw. Then do the same to the black and white wires into the number one and two terminals and tighten their screws. Replace the cover. The oil line to get to the automatic oiler is inside of this enclosure behind this rear back panel. You have to take a three millimeter Allen wrench to remove all these screws and then remove the panel to get to it. Then snip off the wire tie holding the oil line bundle together and slide the line into the enclosure stand. Fish the plastic strapping tape through the side casting hole and into the chip tray. Tape the oil line to the strapping and then pull it through the casting and out the side. Lay the oil line on the rear wire trot, making sure there's plenty to reach the oiler and to give freedom of movement inside the chip tray. Secure it with wire ties, then snip off the excess. Attach the two wire tie mounts provided with this kit to the side of the stand with M5 screws and an Allen wrench. Both the e-stop cable and the oil line are attached to these with some wire ties. Open the electrical cabinet door, then loosen the cable grip nuts under the cabinet with two wrenches. 
the one provided with this kit is larger, so that the hole has to be sized up to 13 16 of an inch with a step drill bit. Install the new cable grip and then tighten with two wrenches. Then slide the cable grip nut onto the new cable from the automatic oiler and feed the cable through the new cable grip. Tighten the locking cap and secure the pass-through with two wrenches. Remove the three trough covers. Route the oiler cable through the bottom trough, the ground cable into the terminal block, and continue to route the other two along the side and top trough. Insert a small flat bladed screwdriver into an empty ground slot and tilt it up slightly. Insert the ground wire and remove the screwdriver. Pull on the wire to check if it is seated securely. Crimp the provided spade connectors onto the end of the white and black wires. The black wire goes to the L13 on the C2 contactor. Loosen L13 with the Phillips screwdriver and since there are several wires already installed, you may have to pull them out a bit to slide the black wire in place. Push them all back in and re-secure the L13 screw. Perform the same procedure on the L23 location to install the white wire. Then clean up the wires in the wire troughs and reinstall the covers. Plug in the 120 volt power cord into the wall outlet. Now to install the 220 service, uh, you have the option of either wiring it directly to an electrical panel and hiring an electrician to do that, or you can go out and purchase a NEMA L620 plug and connect it directly to the wires. Obviously there's extra length, you need to cut it down to length and then use the brown and blue wires to connect to either end and the ground. Reassemble the plug and connect it to the wall outlet. If you have insurance on the 15L, remove the caution, read the operator manual before operating the lathe tag. Then turn the power switch to on and flip the e-stop button open. The path pilot controller will start up and you will have to go through the screen calibration for the touchscreen. Then input the lathe serial number and designate the Tormach model machine you own. Set up the automatic oiler. On the oiler, push and hold the feed button for two seconds. The oiler will then push oil through the distribution system. Examine along the oil line for any leaks. To specify the interval of lubrication, push and hold either of the minutes adjustment buttons. The oiler will beep. To increase interval time, push the up arrow. We recommend you set it to 480 minutes or eight hours. To decrease the interval, press the down arrow. Do not set the interval time to less than five minutes or the equipment could be damaged. To specify the length of time the oil distributes the oil or actuation time, press and hold either of the seconds adjustment buttons. We recommend you set it to 12 seconds. Don't set the actuation time to more than three minutes as that can cause equipment damage. Installing the turret. Open the crate with a breaker bar. If the eye bolt isn't already installed, then screw into the top of the turret and tighten with the screwdriver. The turret will slide into the enclosure back end first, so turn the crate to get the correct direction. Straddle the engine hoist over the turret, then attach the hook to the eye bolt and start to raise the turret. Uh, my first attempt to get it into the enclosure wasn't too good. I had it set all the way down there to two tons. I'm going to extend the arm to half a ton. And since the turret is only 200 pounds, it should be fine. Uh, also to give it some extra room from the top of the enclosure to rest on the bolts, I want to bring this up a couple links. At this point, if your lathe is off, you must make sure to power it on. Turn the main disconnect switch to on. After path pilot boots up, turn the e-stop button clockwise to release it. Press the green start button and click reset on the screen. This is a good point to stone off both the table on the lathe and the bottom of the turret. Make sure both are free of burrs and any debris. From the path pilot interface on the main tab, select ref X 
and ref Z to reference the machine. Since the engine hoist and the turret have to navigate into the enclosure, jog the table closer to the opening and over, but make sure there's at least five inches room to the spindle from the side of the table. The engine hoist legs need to fit underneath the lathe, so measure the height of your hoist legs, then raise your lathe higher on all four corners. Do not raise it too fast on any end, as it could tip the lathe. Insert two of the M10 socket head cap screws two-thirds of the way into the bottom locations for the turret. Don't install the washers at this point. To prevent the turret cable from being damaged as you swing it in, it's advisable to wrap it into a bundle and tape it to the top surface of the turret. Slide the turret into the enclosure and angle it towards the lathe bed. Raise or lower it as needed. Lower the turret onto the two screws and salt into the slots and carefully align them. If you hold the turret in place, it should angle easily into place. If you're uncomfortable doing this on your own, ask for assistance. You may also need someone to help lower the engine hoist as you control the direction of the turret. Install M10 by 30 millimeter socket head cap screws and an M10 flat washer into the open positions on the front of the turret. Then install the remaining three socket head cap screws and washers on the back of the turret. Tighten them relatively securely. One at a time, remove the first two M10 socket head cap screws from the two front slots and then add the M10 flat washers to each and then resecure. Snug down all six screws tightly. When the turret is completely secure, disconnect the lift system from the turret's eye bolt, then pull the engine hoist away from the lathe. Then remove the tape from the cable bundle. Route the turret harness to the electrical cabinet. Power off the machine. Push the e-stop button in. Click exit on PathPilot. When prompted, click OK to power off. Then turn the main disconnect switch to off. Route the turret harness over the back of the lathe and then snip off the bundle ties. Drape the turret harness over the energy chain and use wire ties to secure it to the exterior of three joints on the front, top, and bottom. Then secure it to the x-axis motor cable in two locations. Slide the turret harness between the slot on the back side of the lathe and into the chip tray. This harness has to be fished through the lathe casting. But to do this easily, the plate on the harness should first be clasped by removing both lock nuts. Tape up the encoder connector so that it doesn't get snagged inside the lathe casting. Then tape the harness wires to the plastic shipping strap. Start fishing these wires into the lathe casting. You may need to help it from underneath the casting as it's a tight squeeze. I got it through relatively easily this way. I found it almost impossible with the harness assembled, but others swear they've done it that way. Pull the turret harness through the casting far enough so that the new cover plate can reach beyond the cabinet top box. Once you've pulled the turret harness assembly out of the casting, make sure to reassemble the cover plate with the lock nuts on the other side. To begin routing the turret harness into the electrical cabinet, you must first unscrew the removable cover plate from the cabinet top box. If you have an older lathe that does not have a removable cover plate, open up a support ticket with Tormach customer support. Open the electrical cabinet door on the side of the lathe. Carefully fish the turret harness wires down into the cabinet top box. Pull the wires into the electrical cabinet far enough so that they can reach all connections. Use the two screws set aside earlier to reinstall the turret harness cover plate assembly. Make electrical connections. Thread the four provided M4 standoffs into the four holes on the top of the electrical cabinet back panel. Use four M4 screws to mount the turret control board to the standoffs with the green electrical connections on the left. Use two M4 by 10 millimeter panhead screws to mount the capacitor on the back panel of the electrical cabinet. If your back panel doesn't have the two holes to mount the capacitor bracket, 
Use the bracket as a template to mark the new hole location. Then drill and tap a new hole location. Once that's done, you can then attach the capacitor with the bracket. Connect wires L51 and L52 to the P4 and P5 terminals on the turret control board and the other ends to the capacitor terminals. Since the capacitor is nonpolar, there's no wrong way to connect. Remove the connector block on the side of the turret control board. Then line up the encoder and seat it into place. Open up the ribbon cable locking mechanism on the turret control board. Then line up the ribbon cable and seat it until it's clamped securely. Route the opposite end of the ribbon cable to the lathe control board and secure it in the same manner. The two turret power wires are connected to the power connector block at this point. I noticed that the ferrules in the turret power wires are too long, which is out of spec. We're contacting our vendor to make sure that's correct in the future. If you happen to find something like that, make sure you cut them to a good size so they don't connect. In addition, the copper wires should be cut back as well so they don't connect and cause a short. Loosen the lock screws in the power connector block and connect wires L14 and L24. Retighten the screws snugly. Seat the power connector block into the pins on the bottom of the turret control board. Remove the wire trough covers leading to the lower terminal block and the C1 contactor. Find the turret ground wire and ground wire extension. Then cut the eyelet off of the ground wire and strip off a quarter inch off the end. Attach it to the extension wire by securing it with a small flat bladed screwdriver. Tug on it to make sure it's secure. Route the L14 and L24 wires through the left and bottom wire troughs. Route the ground wire to the terminal block. Then carefully insert the end of a small flat bladed screwdriver straight into an open slot. Pry the terminal clip open carefully. Insert the wire into the terminal block and then slowly remove the screwdriver. Pull on the wire gently to see if it's seated fully. Route the L14 and L24 wire to the C1 contactor. Loosen the terminal lock screw above wire L14 and then piggyback the new L14 spade terminal onto the existing L14 connection on the C1 contactor. Retighten the terminal lock screw to secure both terminal wires. Loosen the terminal lock screw above wire L24 and then piggyback the new L24 spade terminal onto the existing L24 connection on the C1 contactor. Retighten the terminal lock screw above wire L24 to secure both terminal wires. Make sure all the wires are within the wire troughs, then reinstall the covers. Power on the machine by turning the main disconnect switch to on. After path pilot loads, turn the e-stop button clockwise to release it. Then press the green start button. Click reset on the path pilot screen. Then reference the machine by clicking ref X and ref Z. Go to the settings tab and in the tool change options, switch from manual tool change to turret by selecting this option. Then go to the main tab and in the MDI line, type in T08, press the enter key. The turret will then rotate to the last position. To check the other positions, type in T0 and then any location between 1 and 7. Press the enter key to go to that location. In this case, we chose location 5. In the offsets tab, you can press the turret forward button and the turret will move to the next location. You can then cycle through each location if you want. In the RPM dialog box, type in 180 and press enter on the keyboard. Click spindle forward to start the spindle rotation. The spindle will rotate counterclockwise at 180 RPM. Press stop and it will stop. Press reverse and the spindle will rotate clockwise. Pressing stop again to finish this check. All right, all we have left to do is attach a lathe feet to all four sides and then bring the machine down to the ground and we're done with this installation. For the lathe feet, we used to recommend on the threads some grease. Instead, we now recommend anti-seize, which you can find in pretty much any automobile supply store. 
Make sure you use gloves when applying the anises. Apply a thin amount around all the threads and thread the leveler onto the foot. Apply anti-seeds onto the tip of the studs and thread them into the leveler. Then place the spacer onto the stud. Place the top of the post into one of the holes underneath the lathe. At this location, open the side door and secure the washer and nut with the 21 millimeter open end wrench. Repeat this for all four locations. Then reinstall the two small covers that you removed earlier with their screws. You can lower the lathe with the socket wrench, but it might be more difficult. If you do use the impact wrench, be careful not to raise each post too quickly as that can cause the lathe to tip. This footage is sped up, but it took about 12 minutes to slowly lower this lathe down to the ground. Take your time with this. Once the lathe is fully on the ground, each of the posts can be removed. Then each of the lifting feet can be removed at this point. Once the lifting feet are off on all four sides of the machine, take the uh, socket head cap screws, place them in a storage bag, and if any of them are worn out, you can replace them with an M8 by 20 millimeter uh, socket head cap screw with a 1.25 pitch, okay? Once you've replaced any worn socket head cap screws, Place uh, the bag in a box with the threaded rods and the pucks, and then label it well and store it with the lifting feet. Now open the electrical cabinet and bring the cabinet's roller all the way down to the ground by loosening the nuts. Once it's supporting its weight, retighten the nuts and make sure the cabinet rolls smoothly. Setting up the coolant tank. Flip the coolant tank over, then attach each wheel at each location with the provided washer, locking washer and socket head cap screw of which there are 16 sets flip it back over onto the wheels then remove the four phillips screws at the pump location slide the pump into the hole and re-secure it with the screws you just removed insert the nylon washers into one end of the coolant hose and then thread it tightly onto the pump's outtake Slide the coolant tank into the opening under the chip tray. Pull the coolant holes up through the opening in the chip tray. Place the second nylon washer into the other end and thread it onto the nozzle pipe tightly with a wrench. Take the pump's electrical cord and plug it into the coolant electrical outlet on the back. This allows for it to be controlled from PathPilot. Place the chip basket into the chip tray opening and place the hose into the notch. Included with the kit are some uh, test pieces to cut and a cutter. Uh, there's instructions how to do that in the manual. And then we also include some shims that you can use for alignment. We'll be making a video and including it up here for you to follow. Also included in this lathe kit is an extra pulley belt. This is a high belt, which gives you more RPM. Installed in the lathe currently is a low belt, which gives you more torque. Uh, also up here is another video showing you how to install that. Uh, we hope you found these instructions easy to follow. And from our Tormac family to yours, be safe and happy lathing.